Hi everyone, and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today I want to talk about a topic that my general biology students have been asking me for for quite some time. We're going to talk about plant sex. And actually we're going to be talking about alternation of generations. Um, a game that plants are playing that I like to call hide the gametophyte. So if you don't think about plants very often, um, they really do have kind of a tough go. Uh, plants need to be able to find each other to have sex. Plants also need their offspring to be dispersed far away from the parent uh, so they don't compete with each other. You don't want to compete with your offspring for, for resources. Um, the problem is, of course, plants don't move. And so the question is, how are you going to get uh, your gametes, your, your sex cells, how are you going to get those together? How are you going to find members of your own species? How are you going to, you know, find another individual to have sex with? Um, and, you know, what happens when you finally do have offspring? How do you get them far away from you? Um, these are difficult questions. This uh, story is really going to be about sex and life cycles. And like everything, I think it's good to start with something you're familiar with and then build uh, information that may not be so familiar so that your brain kind of has something to attach it to. So we're going to start with humans, actually. These are human chromosomes organized so you can see all 23 pairs. And uh, this is called a karyotype, by the way. And when we talk about sex, uh, there's a little bit of a problem with these chromosomes. So what if we had this scenario? We have an egg, and we said that humans have 46 chromosomes, right? And then what if that egg gets fertilized by a sperm, and that sperm also had 46 chromosomes? Okay, what you have there is a complete disaster, because then every time you have fertilization, you would double the number of chromosomes that an organism would have, and you, you just can't have that. So instead, what we have is an egg cell that has half that number, only 23 chromosomes, and a sperm that has half that number, only 23 chromosomes. And then when you have fertilization, it's oh so much better. Now you have the correct number of chromosomes again. So the vocabulary that we use to talk about chromosome sets is called ploidy. And you're going to see these terms a lot. Haploid, the number of sets in sex cells, so eggs or sperm, they have only one set of chromosomes. We use the letter N for haploid. And then diploid is two sets, and that we're going to find in all somatic cells, other cells in the body. The word soma, by the way, just means body. Um, there are other terms, by the way, especially in plants. You'll see tetraploidy, polyploidy, but for now we're just going to stick with haploid and diploid. That's going to get us through the story uh, that we need. So the human life cycle, with which you are familiar, looks something like this, where we start out with adults, which are diploid. The cells of your body have 46 chromosomes. In cells of the ovary or the testes, you have a very special type of cell division called meiosis. All right, so meiosis only occurs in gamete producing cells. And meiosis is what takes the cell from diploid to haploid. It also creates variety because there's a shuffling of genes, right? Because if you've got to reduce the number of chromosomes by half, then obviously your egg or sperm only gets half of what you've got, right? So now we go from a diploid state to a haploid state. So now the egg and the sperm are each haploid cells. And only at fertilization is the diploid state restored. Right, so egg plus sperm, 23 plus 23. Now we've got a diploid, we call it a zygote, a fertilized egg. And for humans, N is 23, right? So we have 46. Um, just so you know, of course, different species have different numbers of chromosomes. So the, the N value will change. But the haploid, diploid, right, that stays the same. So now we've got a fertilized egg. It undergoes mitosis. That's just replicative division, kind of like a cell, you know, going through a, a Xerox machine, basically. And that happens over and over again, and you end up with a diploid adult. Okay, so if we're to simplify this, so we're going to be able to compare animals uh, with which you're familiar to plants, which may be a little more unfamiliar, we have this, where you have a diploid adult, right? Everything above the line is diploid, 2N. We have meiosis, which is our magic cell division, and the product of meiosis for animals, the products are gametes, 
eggs, and sperm. This is a big difference that we're going to see from plants, so keep that little fact in mind. For animals, the egg and the sperm come together, fertilization, right? We just saw this. Now you restore the diploid condition. You got some mitosis, and now you're back to an adult. Okay, so hang on to your adenoids because this is what the plants do. Plants are kind of foreign to us because they have a whole extra step. We're going to start with the diploid adult, which would be equivalent to an animal. We're going to call it a sporophyte. Okay, and that is diploid. This 2N should now be familiar. That sporophyte is going to undergo that special type of cell division called meiosis, but what you make in a plant is not eggs and sperm. The product of meiosis in plants is a spore. The product of plant meiosis, spores. These spores are haploid and they undergo mitosis and they grow up into a haploid body that we call a gametophyte. Oh my goodness. So this would be an equivalent in humans would be if you could imagine your eggs or sperm leaving your body and without fertilization, they grow up into you, but it would be a haploid you. Okay, that is pretty weird, and animals don't do that, but plants do, and that's why plants make uh, a lot of people a little bit crazy as we try to understand them. This gametophyte will undergo mitosis and produce eggs and sperm, which are called gametes, just like animals, which will fertilize, just like animals, and restore the diploid condition just like animals. That diploid zygote, the fertilized egg, undergoes mitosis and grows into a sporophyte. So this is what you've got to remember with plants. Sporophytes produce spores. Gametophytes produce gametes. So if you can remember this, say it to yourself over and over again, uh, and keep in mind that the product of meiosis in plants and animals, the product is different. In animals, Meiosis produces gametes, eggs and sperm. But in plants, the product of meiosis, spores. If you can keep those things in mind as we go through uh, the various plant groups, you're going to be okay. Um, we're obviously not going to be able to go through 480 million years of plant evolution on a YouTube video. So, um, though you know I would love to try, we're going to talk about a few main groups of plants that will illustrate the difference in the alternation of generations story, which is really what this video, of course, is about. Um, we're going to start with the mosses. Mosses are in a group called bryophytes, and uh, with mosses we have other less familiar plants like liverworts and hornworts. They all have pretty sexy names. When you look at a moss, um, mosses, of course, grow in very, very uh, moist places in the forest and things like that. They need a lot of water because mosses are non-vascular. They don't have any vascular fluid carrying tissues. That also keeps the size of mosses very small. When you look at a moss, what you're looking at is actually the gametophyte stage. So let's look at the moss life cycle and look at some of the, the uh, exciting parts of it and how it relates to the diploid, haploid story. So this moss, as you see it growing on the log, this is what you're actually looking at. You're looking at a haploid gametophyte body. Now gametophytes produce, of course, gametes, eggs and sperm. So there are male and female moss plants. And here are the male parts and here are the female parts. These are all haploid. At fertilization, the egg and sperm, of course, come together and form a diploid zygote. So now we're looking at something that's diploid. The thing is, on a moss, the diploid stage is really small, and we call it a sporophyte, and it actually grows right on top of the haploid gametophyte, and most people have never seen it. Now, as always, the sporophyte produces spores, right? And those spores are haploid because it's the sporophyte that undergoes meiosis. So here you go back into the spore stage. These are now haploid, and they will grow up into the haploid gametophyte, which is where our story began. It's, it's very unusual to actually see the sporophyte in nature. Mostly, you see the gametophyte. That's all that fuzzy green stuff. But this is what the sporophyte looks like, and you'll only see it during certain times of the year. So again, the dominant phase in a moss is the gametophyte. Now let's compare the story of mosses 
to a more highly evolved plant, the fern. Now when you look at a fern, this is the sporophyte stage of the fern. By the way, ferns, beautiful plants, uh, these are vascular plants, so they can get much, much larger than mosses. There's about 12,000 different varieties uh, in this group, and they um, really started to dominate during the, the Carboniferous um, period. That's about 380 million years ago. The fern life cycle, we're going to start again with the dominant phase, the phase that you would see out in the forest. And in the case of the fern, that is not the gametophyte, it's the sporophyte. So what you think of as a, as a fern is actually a sporophyte. A sporophyte produces spores. If you look on the underside of the fern leaf, you're going to see these clusters of sporangia. They're in little circular discs that are called sori. And of course, these undergo meiosis to produce haploid spores. And the haploid spores grow into a gametophyte. This gametophyte is very, very small. In fact, it's microscopic. So unless you go out in the forest with a microscope, uh, you're never going to see it. This is called a fern thallus. It's kind of a heart-shaped uh, thing. Isn't that cute? It's got archegonia, which are female parts, and antheridia, which are the male parts. They only find each other in water, which is why ferns are also uh, very much linked to moist environments, right? There are no desert ferns because of this requirement. So the gametophyte, you've got the male and the female parts, you've got the sperm, you've got the egg, you've got fertilization, same old story. Now we've got a diploid zygote, and now we have the new sporophyte. It actually grows on top of the gametophyte. And as the fern gets larger and we start all over again, the diploid sporophyte is actually growing right out of the gametophyte and the gametophyte will wither away and die. Isn't that just so dramatic? We've got two more groups to go. We're going to talk about the gymnosperms. Now the gymnosperms are the cone-bearing plants. So here is a pine tree and hopefully everybody's familiar with these. When you look at cone-bearing plants or conifers, these are all sporophytes. Okay, the gametophyte has gotten smaller still. The gametes are actually hidden inside the cones. Oh my goodness, I know these life cycles can get a little bit uh, overwhelming with all the terminology, but they're actually just variations on the same story. So we're going to start with, again, the phase that you see in nature. This is the mature sporophyte, right? This is the tree. And the tree, in the cones, we have, of course, meiosis. And the products of meiosis, of course, are spores. And these are haploid. This actually is going to take place within the cone. And at fertilization, of course, uh, there are male and female cones, by the way. Um, female cones are more conspicuous. Uh, male cones, which produce pollen, um, they basically, after they release their pollen, they just uh, uh, wither away and you don't really see them. Um, of course, uh, conifers rely on wind for dispersal, right? So it's just a mass of, of um, pollen in the air from these guys when they are breeding. During fertilization, the diploid state is restored, of course. Now we have our zygote, and it develops within a, um, a seed. And that seed uh, will sprout and grow an entirely new sporophyte. The most advanced of all plants, and certainly the most beautiful by most people's estimation, are the angiosperms. And these are the flowering plants. This is a cherry blossom tree, and in nature, what dominates in angiosperms is the sporophyte. And the gametes are actually hidden inside the flowers. So the flower is the sex organ of the flowering plant. And I just got to say right now, um, <clears throat> it's really no coincidence that flowers are a symbol of, of love and, and romance. Um, if you give a woman a corsage, that, that's not a subtle message, right? You're basically saying, wear this sex organ and, and think of me. Okay, so again, the diploid state is what we're going to start with. The plant itself is a sporophyte, right? So here's a really nice flowering plant. And within the flower, within the flower, you have meiosis going on to form the egg and, in this case, the pollen, the pollen grains. And the plant has to pay for that special touch in a lot of cases. Now, some angiosperms are also... Um, uh, wind pollinated, but a great majority of them make big, bright, showy flowers to attract pollinators. 
Um, the problem is, of course, that uh, that's expensive. Flowers have to pay for service in the cold, hard currency of nectar, right? And of course, if you're pollinated by birds, uh, it's going to cost you even more. But for the plants, it appears to be worth it. As the pollen is delivered from uh, flowers far away, it will the pollen grain will stick onto the stigma. It actually fits very precisely. This is to prevent uh, pollination across different species. So it's kind of like a lock and a key right here. And then the pollen grain will grow a tube and grow all the way down to the uh, egg, you have fertilization, diploid condition is restored, and now you have the development of the embryo within a seed. And for even better dispersal, uh, the ripened ovary becomes a fruit, and the plant will pay even more to get its offspring far, far away from the parent plant, and you make it nice and juicy and tasty so that uh, seed dispersal can occur, and birds and mammals will eat the fruit digest the seeds, activate the seeds, and then deposit them in a nice pile of fertilizer far, far away from the parent plant. Oh my goodness, even dispersal is expensive for plants. So the summary of the story is that as we look through evolutionary uh, development of plants, as plants become more and more complex, that increasing complexity means you have to have more genes, and the more genes you have, the more likely it is that you're going to be safer as a diploid sporophyte than as a gametophyte. In other words, the gametophyte phase, because you only have one copy, if something bad happens and you have a lethal error in a gametophyte stage, you're out, right? But if you're a diploid sporophyte, you have a backup copy. So you want to spend more and more time as a diploid sporophyte the more genes you have. And this certainly holds true for animals as well, right? So we spend more of our life cycle, much more, as a diploid organism and a very, very a small amount of time as haploids. So that is the story of the hide the gametophyte game that the plants are playing with us. Um, I really hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please visit on Twitter and Facebook. And as always, good luck.